Hello, this is Patty from Pennsylvania, and I just love having that cup of cocoa with my morning coffee. If you'd like to leave a review or ask a question that's featured on the podcast, just go to breakglasspodcast.com. In case of emergency, break glass. Real conversations, real stories about women who have walked the glass cliff and shattered the glass ceiling with your host, Cheryl Coco. Hi, and welcome to the Break Glass Podcast. I'm your host, Cheryl Coco. They call me Cup of Coco. And today we're going to talk about Marissa Ann Mayer. Marissa is a big deal. She was on Fortune Magazine's annual list of America's 50 most powerful women in business from 2008, along the likes of Oprah, Oprah, right? Oprah Winfrey, Sue Decker of Yahoo, and Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook. To 2014, she was 33. That was a little bit ago for me, (laughs) but she was 33 when she was first listed which made her the youngest woman ever listed. Drake Bear, in his Business Insider article about the 2014 list, wrote that even with the progress in female leadership, the list is a reminder that the glass ceiling is still very much present. Only 4.8% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. That means, hey, ladies, if you're listening, there's room for you too. want to see you on there. So. In this episode, we're going to focus more, though, on the glass cliff rather than the glass ceiling. If you're not sure what the glass cliff is, maybe you're wondering what's the glass cliff, that's okay. Stick with me and all will be revealed like the rooms of a house with glass walls. In 1975, Time Magazine awarded its Man of the Year to drumroll please american women their article great changes new chances tough choices says 1975 was not so much the year of the woman w-o-m-a-n as the year of the women w-o-m-e-n an immense variety of women altering their lives entering new fields functioning with a new sense of identity integrity and confidence 1975 was the year that Marissa Ann Mayer was born on May 30th, six days after Shining Star by Earth, Wind, and Fire became number one on the Billboard charts. Take a second, sing it if you know it. Now, Marissa was a shining star in both academics and extracurricular activities, despite being painfully shy when she was younger. Stanford University is where Yahoo was founded. You guys remember that, right? Yahoo! (laughs) But where Yahoo was founded in 1994 by Jerry Yang and David Philo. Three years later, Marissa graduated from Stanford University with an undergraduate degree in symbolic systems. I'll tell you what that means in a second because when I first saw it, I was like, what does that mean? And then in 1999, with a master's in computer science, then she received not one or two, or five, or ten, but 14 job offers. 14. One of the job offers was a teaching job at Carnegie Mellon University, and another one was a consulting job at McKinsey & Company. So in case you're wondering, like I was, right, when I first saw it, what Symbolic Systems is, Lisa Miller in her 2012 article in The Cut titled, Can Marissa Mayer Really Have It All?, wrote that it's a mixture of philosophy, brain science, and artificial intelligence, okay? So, have you ever heard of the term analysis paralysis? When you have all these things and decisions, or you have all of this info, but you are paralyzed and can't make a decision? So, according to Investopedia, analysis paralysis is an inability to make a decision due to overthinking a problem. An individual or group can just have too much data. The result is an endless wrangling over the upsides and downsides of each option and an inability to pick just one. I'm sure we've all faced analysis paralysis 
one time. I hope that it was because you had 14 job offers. Now, we're going to hear how Marissa deals with her analysis paralysis. But you would think that having such a wide variety of choices when starting your career would be a good thing. I'm sure it was. But it's also quite challenging for the young Marissa Mayer. Years later, she revealed in a Stanford Graduate School interview just how challenging it was for her to make a choice. Now, in the interview, she said that it was easy for her to pick the best offer of each type of offer that she had. So she knew that if she was going to go with consulting, she would be most interested in McKinsey. If she was going to go to pick a big company, she would most be interested in Oracle. She had already done quite a lot of lecturing at Stanford at the time. And she had been offered to go to Carnegie Mellon to lecture in their computer science program. So if she picked that option, she was going to go there. If she picked the startup route, then she was probably going to pick Google. She said, I found it very difficult to integrate across the different disciplines because the job offers were just so different. She thought a lot about her options and gave herself the deadline of May 1st. 1999. Now, I hope we all have a friend like Andre, but she enlists the help of a friend named Andre. It's one of her longtime friends, and she said to him, I just need someone who can help me really synthesize all these different types of jobs. Andre was really happy to help, so they went into battle. They had things like matrices and graphs and curves, and they analyzed and analyzed and analyzed some more. Then at around midnight, Marissa got really overwhelmed, and Andre came to the rescue. Listen to this. Listen to this really closely, because Marissa says that in an interview, Andre told her these words, you're looking for the right choice. You think there's one right choice and 13 wrong ones. Remember, she has 14 job offers, so she's thinking, you have one right choice and 13 wrong ones. Andre says, I see 14 very good choices. Then there's one that you're going to pick and commit to and make great and feel good about. It's not going to be a matter of right versus wrong. Marissa went on to say that people ask her what's the best advice that she's ever gotten. And she says it was at that moment from Andre. I think we can all take that advice from Andre, right? Andre then told her to go to bed. And whatever she thought of first thing in the morning, that that's what she should do. He urged her to follow her gut. I would tell you to follow your holy hunch. <laughs> so Marissa goes to bed. And when she wakes up in the morning, she says she wanted to go to work at Google. She said, I felt like the smartest people were there. I wanted to work at Google because I felt really unprepared to do it. When was the last time that something inspired you because you felt unprepared, because you thought it would stretch you? I love this about her. She says, I wanted to work at Google because I felt really unprepared to do it. The name itself could be a punchline. I could imagine my future family reunion. She went to this company called Google. Hi, yes. My name is Teresa Cedario, and I just want to let you know that I was so inspired by the Break Glass podcast. Truly inspirational. Thank you for putting that out. Have a great day. In 1998, Larry Page was the CEO of Google. Marissa briefly dated him. She joined Google in 1999 as employee number 20. She joined Google in 1999 as employee number 20. While working there, she taught introductory computer programming at her alma mater and also mentored students at the East Palo Alto Charter School. She was the one who oversaw the layout of Google's unadorned search homepage. That's my girl. Here we go. In 2002, she began the Associate Product Manager Program, which was a mentorship initiative to recruit new talent and cultivate them for leadership roles. She was also, the girl was spinning some plates up in here. Hold up. She was also on the team responsible for Google AdWords. And AdWords helped deliver 96% of Google's revenue in the first quarter of 2011. It was also in 2011 that Marissa secured Google's acquisition of Zagat for $125 million. 
damn, she was doing it all. Right? Yet, it was in 2011. Like, get that she's doing all the things. Like, all of it. In 2011, she was passed up for an important promotion. Jay O'Dell, in his July 2012 article titled, The Real Reason Marissa Mayer Left Google, she had to. Google had put Mayer in charge of local products in 2010, but the company tapped Jeff Huber to head up local products and commerce as a senior vice president the following year. The glass ceiling loomed nearer and nearer. And finally, Marissa hit it and hit the road. This is gutsy shit. In July 2012, the Forbes article titled Marissa Mayer and the Glass Cliff, Helene Olin begins by asking, did Marissa Mayer just receive the job offer of a lifetime or did she just ascent to the pinnacle of the glass cliff? According to Investopedia, the term glass cliff, get this, listen close, this is crazy, refers to a situation where women are promoted to higher positions during a time of crisis or duress or during a recession when the chance of failure is more likely. In other words, they are set up for failure. In our podcast journey, we're going to talk about the glass cliff and the glass ceiling and I need you to understand the power of this glass cliff. It refers to a situation where women are promoted to higher positions during times of crisis or duress or during a recession when the chance of failure is more likely. In other words, they are set up for failure. Marissa served as the president and chief executive officer of Yahoo. Yahoo. From July 2012, on the day the announcement was made, she announced, like a boss, that she was pregnant. When she was appointed, Yahoo's numbers were behind those of Google's, and there had been several top management changes. In 2012, Helene Olin put it this way, the company's been in internet for years, with a stock price to match that assertion. Mayer is its third CEO, fifth if you count interim holders of the title, in a period of less than a year. In 2014, Marissa Ann Mayer was ranked sixth on the on Fortune's 40 under 40 list and was ranked the 16th most powerful businesswoman in the world that year. On December 10th, 2015, Marissa announced that she had given birth to identical twin girls two weeks later. Marissa was listed by Richtopia at number 14 in the list of 500 most influential CEOs. Hold up. In the next year, Fortune named Marissa as one of the world's most disappointing leaders. Gotta be kidding me. In January 2017, it was announced that she would step down from the company's board upon the sale of Yahoo's operating business to Verizon Communications. She gave her resignation on June 13, 2017, but over her tenure at Yahoo, monthly visits on Yahoo's homepage dropped from almost $10 billion to less than $5 million, while Google's increased from $17 billion to over $56 billion. In Eric Emmons Woods' June 2017 article titled, Marissa Mayer Officially Leaves Yahoo, Looks Forward to Using Gmail Again, that was the title. We are told that she reportedly said, I look forward to using Gmail again. I'm always faster when using a tool I designed myself. Marissa tweeted that she would continue to use the excellent Yahoo Mail too. The team's hard work paid off with a dramatically better product. Marissa was married in 2009 to Zachary Bogue. They have three children. Having worked from home toward the end of her pregnancy, Mayer returned to work after giving birth to a boy on September 30th, 2012, and built a mother's room next to her office suite. She was criticized for this because in February 2013, she oversaw a personnel policy change at Yahoo that required all remote working employees to convert to in-office roles. However, in April 2013, Mayer changed Yahoo's maternity leave policy, lengthening its time allowance and providing a cash bonus to parents. 
On May 20th, 2013, Marissa led Yahoo to acquire Tumblr. Two months later, Yahoo reported a fall in revenues, but a rise in profits compared with the same period in the previous year. In September 2013, it was reported that the stock price of Yahoo had doubled over the 14 months since Mayer's appointment. Meanwhile, Marissa was also buying a former mortuary, oddly, okay, for $11.2 million, and the neighborhood actually spoke out against the wild Halloween parties she would throw there. Marissa co-founded Sunshine, formerly Lumi Labs, with her former colleague Enrique Munoz Torres, a company focusing on artificial intelligence and consumer media. She is a board member of, wait for it, Cooper Hewitt. National Design Museum, New York City Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and Walmart. What has Marissa been up to in 2022? One headline informs us that former Yahoo CEO Marissa Mayer tore down three houses to build a pool at her Palo Alto mansion. Her 2022 book recommendations include The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman and The Charisma Myth by Olivia Fox Cabanet. So what can we learn from Marissa Mayer? Well, we learn that shyness is not an excuse for us to shy away from greatness. We learn that it's okay to ask for help from trusted friends. Remember that, Andre? Especially when faced with daunting decisions. We learn that when faced with two or more equally appealing choices, we should say no to analysis paralysis and just pick one, then commit to that one and give it our all. We learn that sometimes rather than spending so much time and energy trying to break the glass ceiling over and over again, it's wise to see the writing on the glass wall and seek greener pastures, even if those greener pastures could turn out to be glass cliffs. Damn. We learn that for 21st century women, it's no longer a case of either a career or family with careful planning and support. A woman can have both and succeed in both. I hope you were have been inspired by Marissa Mayer's journey as much as I have, and I hope that you join us on the next Break Glass podcast for an episode all about Meg Whitman of Hewlett Packard and discover some life lessons from her story. Is it the glass cliff? Is it the glass ceiling? Let's learn from women before us in powerful positions. Come find out about Meg Whitman of Hewlett Packard and discover some life lessons from her story on the next episode. Thanks so much. This has been your Cup of Cocoa. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort. Now, you know what to do. In case of emergency, break glass with your host, Cheryl Coco.